David Barnes with me this morning. Now, David's a money guy, but he likes to get into politics as well. I want to get your take on the Republicans being in disarray. Well, it is disarray. It starts with a leadership problem. It starts with the fact that they lost a bunch of elections because they nominated terrible candidates. So they don't have a clear majority. Uh, by the way, the people who voted against this impeachment of America is Tom McClintock is one of the most conservative members Congress has ever had. He's in California, rock solid conservative. Mike Gallagher is too in Wisconsin. Um, this is, this is a ridiculous approach. And so they're just all over the map. And then you see the other side, this, this response from Katie JP about Biden's health, it doesn't match with what the people are thinking. It's obvious there's an issue. So on both sides, you see real dysfunction, in my opinion. OK, you are a money guy, so we'll talk about the markets. I want to talk to you about the Magnificent Seven, mm. because you think <laughs> you think it's going to be down to the Magnificent Two or Three by the end of the year. Oh, who gets the cut? Well, we'll have to see. I mean, I'm being optimistic that there'll be two or three still rolling by the end of the year because Meta Facebook is up so much this year after they declared the first ever dividend last week and had the biggest single up day in the history of the stock market on Friday. Most market cap added in one day ever was Facebook on Monday. But then, you know, Tesla's down big on the year. Uh, Apple's down a little bit. There's a few names that aren't really moving. So the Magnificent Seven is not all moving together like it did last year. So who's it going to be? If it's down to two or three at the end of the year, which are the two or three? Um, I would say, if I had to bet, that Microsoft and NVIDIA and Meta are in a better position than Apple and, and uh, clearly right now, Tesla and Google. Um, Google's yeah. already down not quite a bit on the year. Um, but all of them, I think, are overpriced. It's okay. just you're asking me to pick which ones I think are relatively healthier than the others. Now, you are a dividend guy. Right. Meta declared its first ever dividend. Yeah, 0.4%. I, think... I can't believe you're even talking about it. You get mad at me when I mention a 3% <laughs> dividend payer. I just thought I'd bring it up. 0.4%. So Facebook basically is paying a dividend that is equal to the tip I gave my waiter on second <laughs> Avenue last night. It amounts, though, to $700 million worth of dividend income for uh, the guy. Uh, what's it, Zuckerberg? Uh, it does. And so the dollars look big, but as a percentage of free cash flow, it's very, very minimal. We'll see where it goes from here. You don't want to know about it. I got that, David. Thank you. Now, we've got a huge loss for Snap on your screens. It's down 31% now. What's the problem, Lauren? Well, Meta and Google are stealing the ad dollars. You got any comment? Yeah, they've lost money every single quarter. <laughs> so what do they mean they're losing ad revenue? They lose over a billion dollars a quarter. They've never made any money. Really? And now it's a bad quarter. Now <laughs> Facebook's taking their advertisers. They've never made a profit in any never. quarter. Never. Never. They're, they're never going to make a profit. They're also blaming ah. conflict in the Middle East, which oh, I just the conflict find in the Middle East is an excuse. We are seeing that turn up for a couple of companies. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean. Snap. A lot of the Middle Eastern <laughs> uh, customers <laughs> of Snap. There you go. Well, you uh, made a, yeah, a I, solid point there, David. You really did. Uh, okay, moving on. I bought some Uber about two, three, four months ago, Ooh. and they reported this morning. Uh, the stock is down yeah. 2%. What's wrong Revenue with that? Revenue climbed 15%. Oh, is, it, is this one of those expectations things where the analyst said, oh, we're expecting this. We didn't quite make it, so down goes the stock. Is that it? I think they beat on expectations. I, I, I have another theory, bit. if you want to hear it. I do. How about they're trading at 133 times earnings? Could oh. that be part of it? Perhaps I should not have bought it. <laughs> I mean, even on forward That's earnings, expensive. if everything goes the way they say, because I think Warren's right that they were pretty much in line with expectations. Yeah. They're trading at 72 times forward yeah. earnings. The stock Ford, I know they reported after the bell. I think they're scaling back on the EV oh, look business. And, and the street go up. loves it. Of course it's they up they 7%. Okay. They lost I, all the I'm, EVs. I'm just going to give you some eye-popping numbers. E the red ink in their EV business, $4.7 billion in losses. Hmm. And the reason they're up, special dividend on top of their regular dividend, so they're rewarding shareholders. And oh. that dividend is coming from real profits, so they're losing money in EV because, wait for it, everybody loses money in EV. Everybody. They still made, this is real EBITDA, $15 billion last year. They're trading at nine times earnings. We don't own Ford. I love this dividend boost for Ford shareholders, but the EV um, problem is being offset by other real profits. Hmm. Okay, so they sideline EVs and make money elsewhere. That's yeah, Snap should buy Ford. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be not, a fun car, actually. Uh, <laughs> let's bring in David. 
He's got his perennial and uh, constant uh, dividend picks, and he's starting with one we've heard from before, Simon Property Group. Right. They released their earnings on Monday afternoon, and the stock was up 4.5% yesterday. They're still yielding over 5.5%, even though the stock's up 40% in the last few months. They have 96% occupancy. They've grown net operating income over 7% year over year. They're getting more rent for more customers ever. That death of the all theory doesn't seem to be going very well. And they pay 5%? 5 percent? Five and a half percent, and they raise the dividend on Monday as well. That's something you like, I can see, right. Texas Instruments, I never associate them with big dividends, or growing dividends. Well, it's a 3.3 percent dividend yield, and they've grown it about 8 percent per year for 10 years in a row. It's a great dividend growth. What's interesting here is that they're trading at a much less multiple than other names in their space, microchips, semiconductors. They're uh, at a cheaper valuation than their customers. It's a very well run company. They're going to they're gonna need a little time. This is a long-term hold, but Texas Instruments is very much worth looking at. Got it. David, thanks very much indeed. You don't think that this debt situation is as bad as we're making out? I just think that people are trying to make this political and partisan, and I'm a conservative Republican who refuses to do that. The debt levels or credit card debts are a little bit higher than they were, but the assets and incomes are much higher, and that's the way everyone knows you're supposed to look at it, the ratio of the debt to the assets. So so that's what happened in 2008, is the debt exploded, but the assets were lower, incomes were lower. That's real bad. Right now, I don't like seeing credit card balances go higher, but let's be honest about it. It's against a denominator that is healthier, more assets, more income. It's hurting low-income people the most. It's not a non-story, but I want to tell the whole story. And I think that there is debt related to assets that we have to consider. Existing home sales hit a near 30-year low, lowest since 1995. EJ, what does that tell you? Uh, the housing market has been completely frozen over by these violent changes in interest rates. And, and what has the source of, of that been? It's been the government spending so much money that it didn't have. So Powell kept rates way too low for way too long in order to finance those deficits. Uh, David, you got a comment? I, I think we're missing the biggest point. You have to build new houses. You have to build more houses. It's a supply problem. We haven't built enough sure. homes. It's primarily a blue state problem. has nothing to do with Jay Powell or Joe Biden. You've got to build more houses. you just got to get around the planning permission, haven't you, EJ? That's right. Well, you you know, to, to David's point, though, on new houses, one of the reasons why that has really slowed as well is the fact that the price indexes faced by home builders is at a record high. So they can't really bring their prices down. Not good all round, is it? You know, we'd better take a look at Tesla. It's down to $185 a share as of right now. Bloomberg reports that performance reviews have been postponed. Uh-oh. Tesla managers have been asked which jobs are critical. David. Does that mean layoffs are coming or a big shuffle, another big shuffle at Tesla? Uh, it's very possible. We should remember what Elon Musk did when he took over Twitter. He fired quite a bit of people. Oh, Musk yeah. has always been a very big believer in lean and mean. And if Tesla is perhaps overhired, I don't think he would hesitate to lay people off. It's down. The stock is down 25 percent just this year, this calendar year. As I believe. Yeah, is I think it, it's more than that. I think it's down in the 30s, but it was up 100% last year, so it's a very volatile stock. I would not wish to work for Elon Musk, having read the book about oh, him. Oh, I think yeah. people that own stock in uh, Tesla and SpaceX are very happy to work for <laughs> I'm Elon sure Musk. they are. That's right. <laughs> what was that, producer? That would be this calendar year or the. Okay, this calendar year, Tesla is down 25% this go. calendar year. Now, I have in my ha little hands here a new book. It is called Full Time Work and the Meaning of Life, and David Barnson wrote it. So, okay, I've got something, I've got a comment here. In America, we live to work. In Europe, they work to live. Well, I think that's been true for about almost 250 years, and it's becoming untrue in America. That's my big concern, that at each generation, we've had a marginal decrease in our appetite for work, our love of work, our belief in the purpose and dignity that comes from work. If we lose that, that, <clears throat> more than any political issue, accelerates America's move to be more of a European-like state. I want to fight it with every ounce of breath in my body. God made us to work. There's dignity in work. But are we just being oldsters? 
looking at the new generation and saying they just don't have well, it. For, first of all, I'm critical of some of the older people. I you I admire guys like you that are still working. I'm not going to say your age, but I don't like <laughs> 60 year olds. I don't they decide to go play golf seven days a week. OK, so this is not a generational thing at each level. Look, prime working age men, 25 to 49, have the lowest labor participation they've had in forever. That is true. That's the area I'm most concerned about is that at every age level, I think we see a uh, decline in work appetite. Work is good. I'll leave it at that. It's made by God for our benefit. David, it was a pleasure having you on the show for the hour. Thank Appreciate you. it. And I like the new book.